The 2015 movie The Revenant, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, is considered by many to be a classic Western. Joe, are you crazy? You're going back to school about this to find out what a classic is. Give me your hand. Ah! Come on, Joe, back to the classroom. Let's see if you've done your homework. On the Real Watch List Plus. Now, little alfalfa. Yes, Mrs. Crabtree. Yeah. Well, have you done your homework? I watched The Revenant. Yes. And, you know, I read some things about it. Yeah. And there's some people that think it's like a classic, a modern classic Western. So, well, I they don't do, know why do it is. they? They do. They do. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, little alfalfa, because I don't want you to stay after school again mm -hmm. because you have to walk home with the wolves and all those things. I want you to be safe. Put your books down okay. and get your blackboard out and let's go over your blackboard and we find out what is a film classic. Now, I'm going to ask you uh -huh. each one okay. and you tell me what you think and then you're either going to get an A uh -huh. or a Z. A Z? A Z. A Z? Yes, a Z. What the hell is this? Okay, so for? let's go through this now and okay. we will. What's the first one, Miss Crabtree? Can you point to it? Yes, I certainly shall. I'll watch my giant pointer because it hits as well. Ooh. Number one, does it capture a moment in time? Okay, so the revenant uh, captures a moment in time in the past. So, yes. Not really. Oh? It captures a time in the life of a person, but what that means in film classes, it captures something quintessential. Oh. This is a story about Hugh Glass. It tells about his life, but it really doesn't capture a moment in time that lasts through centuries, not centuries, but decades, uh -huh. to the American public. Hey. So you're oh. wrong, little alfalfa, you're wrong. Number two, does it capture the apotheosis of the genre? What it is is, is it the standard of a Western? Does it have the Western things, saloons, sheriffs, uh -huh. shootouts, cowboys, Western vistas, horses, and indigenous Americans or Indians. Apotheosis. Apotheosis. Of genre. So is it a Western? Well, it's in the West. Well, so is it in the West? It's not considerable the normal West that was depicted in John Ford movies and oh. from my darling Clementine oh. right up to no, not that West. This was up in Montana country. <gasps> Okay, and uh... So what do you think, yes or no? I'm afraid to answer, I'm gonna say no. No, 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 no. It doesn't. <gasps> Yay! Yay! Love, 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 you get a candy. Is it 25 years old? Uh, no, it's not 25 years old. No, right, no, correct, no, no, correct. No, no, no. Another candy for you. Yeah. And I'll give you the apple that you gave me three weeks ago, you get it back. Oh. It's still good. Oh. Uh, is it referred to by film scholars and critics? I say no. It has never been referred to by film scholars and critics over the years. And what we mean by reference okay. is that it's compared for a standard of the genre so they can study it and oh, refer it and copy it. Okay, okay. Number five, you're very close. Okay. You've done very, very well, okay, little okay. alfalfa. Miss Crabtree's pleased with you. Oh, thank you. Very pleased. Mm -hmm. Number five. Does this have the revenant longevity over time? Uh, I'm going to say it's, no, because it's no longer, it's less than 25 years, so I'm going to say that it's, uh, it's not. No, 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 no. Absolutely right. Yay! Yay! You're learning what a film classic Yay! is. So why don't we switch over to Joe and Debbie, the film critics, I, 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 and they can review the movie The Revenant, the 2015 picture from 20th Century Fox. It is considered more of a wilderness adventure than a classic Western. Now, it's from 2015, so a lot of people have seen this movie. It was, you know, we're not denigrating the movie. It was a big film. It won Oscars, all this other stuff that we'll get into. But the plot is, in 1823, on a fur training expedition, fights for survival after a horrendous grizzly attack and is left for dead by his rotten cohorts in his hunting party. Shot in 2015, you have a different style, obviously, of cinematography than your traditional Western. So when I think of Westerns, I think of 
you know, High Noon, I think of John Wayne, I think of, as we talked about in other episodes of Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, even um, Tombstone. Classics, to some degree, more than others. Well, before we go on, because we do have our thing, let's, let's do with our costumes. We started oh, sure. it in a kind of a silly way. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did look like Mrs. Bates. I didn't mean to. But we wanted to use the old Little Rascals type of schooly wooly. We used classic characters. Classic characters. Mrs. Crabtree. Right. I was Alfalfa, if you remember Spanky and, and the Our Gang. Yeah. Now, if you want these classic outfits, go to the link below and check out the Amazon uh, links to these, whether it's a sweater, whether it's a bow tie, whether it's the beanie propeller. Um, my wig, my glasses, my pearls. Yeah, check it out. And with each purchase that you use through our link, you help us grow the show. Flip. I am surprised you gave it a five. Well, I, I, I'll tell you why. First of all, I know it's a bear claw because Thank I've you. been schooled because we had Winnie the Pooh before. So now I know what it looks like mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like hockey pucks now because it actually has toes so i that's had a good toes thing. in the last one yeah Check but they, out the video you're getting better because you're taking art class i'm taking art class you're taking art class singing lessons everything to prepare for these shows well, this show. we're just um the reason i'm giving it a five is because i really don't consider it a western you can fight with me you can beat me up you can drag me with mules down the road but i really don't i consider it a wilderness adventure okay and only because it doesn't have the classic things that a Western has. And genre is something that you particularly have to stay in line. And if you can look it up, because these hashtags and all this other stuff, and it says it's a Western, the young people put things in with it because they want more people to look at it. So if you look it up and you put in something to stream and you say, you're not going to put in wilderness adventure, maybe some people will. But if they put Western and they want something of a period piece from this particular century, mm -hmm. It'll come up. Right. But see, that's, that's the misnomer about this movie. Because when you look this up and you do the research, you do see the tag many times that says Western. Correct. And I don't think it's fair, especially no. for someone that might be interested in film, interested in the study of classics, to associate this in that category. I think it, it throws it off. Now, what's ironic is that we reviewed um, many movies that at the time that the movie came out, many celebrated movie reviewers like Siskel and Eber, New York Times, Time Magazine, would criticize a movie. We just did one uh, called Butch Cassidy and the Sundance right. Kid. We reviewed that. And these major name reviewers trashed the film, only to be later right. considered by many as a classic movie. So Rex Reed said gave Jaws like a four. He said it was four. one of the worst movies he ever saw. So after we go through this film, let's discuss if this would be something in the future that could change the way that we think of a classic. Leonardo DiCaprio. So the, the big issue with this film is the bear. Now, Hugo is a nonfiction person. He's a real person. This story is a story of revenge. And where it departs from real life is that if you read more about Hugo, Hugh, I'm sorry, Hugh Glass, yeah. not, to be, not to be confused with Hugo Boss, Hugh Glass was a story of forgiveness, completely different okay. than this storyline. Now, if you watch the trailers and you, you, you read about the movie, they use the, the coin the term inspired by real events. Well, it's very loose. A lot of people have seen this, and because it was a big movie and everybody went to it, the only thing everybody remembers from it is the bear, the bear. attack. Like the and bear. the bear attack was so horrendous, you can't even look at it. And the director watched hundreds of bears, bear attacks on mm -hmm. film. And it was not only CGI, of course, you know, but there was a guy in a costume and an actual bear that was all fused together for that footage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, the guy, the stuntman, um, dressed up in blue and put a, a, a bear hat on because the director wanted as real as possible, this mauling. Um, and it's funny because he mentions it, and I, I wrote down a little, little note that I thought was um, kind of a little bit of trivia. Uh, the stuntman was six foot four, um, Glenn Ennis. He ended up in the bear suit. He said that uh, he was the only man that was up Leonardo DiCaprio's butt. Really? That he actually, in, in that scene, oh, yeah, he, that's right. he was... 
his head was his head by his, his rear butt. end, literally. And while he's completely straight, he yeah. said that, I'm sure it was a lot of people who would like to be in my position Especially at that Especially 20-year-old uh, girls, because that's all he'll date, Leo. He won't go, if you're 25, right. you're like, oh, out. Oh, that. no. Uh, he's known for that. It was brutally savage. I mean, it was just hard to... And, and even in the opening sequence of this uh, film... I was just going to say that. Frigging savage. It was so, <laughs> yeah. To me, you know, I'm thinking, is the director trying to portray as close to what happened or what could have happened by giving these gory images of people getting, whether it's decapitated, um, you know, whether it's spears and, yeah. and um, arrows going through bodies from the American Indians. What is it? And I'm thinking, I'm watching like a horror movie here. This is not like... But, event, but here's it, a, To me, I don't think it made the story. Right. I think it actually made the story worse because I was like, mm. oh, God. Oh, It'll like, turn off like, certain people unless you really want to watch it. Off. Yeah, it's very tough. But if you look at things like differences, I'm going to give an example of World War II pictures. The Longest Day, greatest probably World War II movie ever. Mm -hmm. And then in other films, and then you watch Saving Private Ryan where the guys come up on the beach. Oh, I saw that, yeah. How yeah. brutal that mm -hmm. was with the bullets going through mm -hmm. the water. So the reality is more in modern cinema as far as special effects, brutality, makeup, Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot better than they had in the past, even though I'll fight it. I love old special effects. He, first of all, the cinematographer filled it with natural light. He didn't want to use extra lighting. And he wanted it to look bleak and just the way it did. Plus, I think it was pretty savage when those Indians attacked. Right. Because, you know, they, just think about people coming in, taking your stuff, your land. Right. There was no communication, remember, and, and the cohorts of Hugh Glass, they were from France, they were from different countries, mm -hmm. they spoke different languages. These guys were not friends. They were right. put together to, to go on an expedition, to go through it, get to the end of it, and deliver a payload of furs, mm -hmm. and they did it, you know, every year. Right, right. But I think adding that goriness, yeah. I think, took away from the film. Like, you mentioned Private Ryan. And, I, and I, I saw that film, and when I saw that, it honestly made me feel like that was happening. Heartfelt, like 100%. Sorry, it's I hit my mic. flies all over the place. Sorry, we're in the woods here, And I'm folks. hitting my mic like a nutcase. But here I'm watching it, I'm not feeling that it's real. I'm feeling that it's like you're, you're just doing it to get me savagery to... Savagery for the sake you, of savagery. You're doing it to get a, get a, a rise yeah. out of me, rather right. than to yeah. portray some realism. They did a lot of that in the film. Um, that's what took away points for me. I want to go into Leo a little bit because sure. I love Leo. I think he's one of our Ugh, greatest American actors. And I this don't. is what, but, well, I'm, I can love You know why I love him too? Because he looks like my son. When my son mm. was young, he was mistaken for Leo when I went to a premiere in New York. Mm. But anyway, Leo only had 10 minutes of dialogue in this thing. Mm -hmm. But they gave him the Oscar because it was a very physical thing. But you don't get Oscars for physical things. Actually, Leo had deserved the award years before. And you tell somebody to go watch this mm -hmm. movie mm -hmm. for Blood Diamond, about the diamond trade. The mm -hmm. De Beers I Diamond does the diamonds. were so ruthless in mm -hmm. getting the diamonds. He deserved it. He got cheated for that. He got cheated a couple times, you know. Tom Hardy, who was in it, who was his nemesis, mm -hmm. is li one of Leo's best friends. And, and, and originally it was supposed to be Sean Penn. But God knows right. what's wrong with Sean Penn. He's so crazy that he probably punched somebody and they threw him out. Well, the director had a prior uh, filming relationship with Sean Penn. Uh, and I, I, to me, when reading that, that it was like, okay, now I've, now I've kind of figured out yeah, why he was Yeah, because Sean Penn is so difficult. Right, but he worked with um, the director in a prior film, and I'll talk about that when we get to the director. Okay. In this film, Tom Hardy, I like. He's, he's I can't pin him down. Because Tom Hardy, for those that may not know him, um, has appeared in actually a lot of film for a young, He's a Brit. A yeah. young actor. Matter of fact, there was rumor that he might be under consideration for the new Bond. I mean, that whole it's a British he's not actor. Cute enough. No, he's kind of a rugged looking. Plus, you know, guy. there's ambiguous feelings if he's gay or not. Did you know that? I did know that. That's, right. why, that's why there's a little interest. Like, mm. he did go through bouts of depression and yeah. alcoholism. He had some rough patches there. Uh, he's been sober for, for many years. Um, and he's made some bad film choices, but some good, but they right, do, you know. Right. But he's also known as not reading the script before selecting the movie. Well, that's brilliant. Well, an that's, and I, think it was, I think it was Leonardo DiCaprio that she said to him, like, 
like, read the script. Like, you gotta like look at this before you make a decision. There's that fly. Well, why do you hate Leo so much? What's with that? So, well, I read you don't a, hate him, I'm sorry, I watched a documentary on um, Netflix. You and called, these documentaries. I keep I referring back to Men on the Run, which was about IMDB, which was a fund created in Malaysia to help the poor people or to, to help develop Malaysia into bringing jobs, bringing roadway, and improving people's lives. And the funds were actually used through the prime minister, through connections, and through this nefarious person, um, Joe Lowe, which is actually Low Tech Joe, which many people call Joe Lowe. So he's a good name, Joe Lowe. Joe Lowe, yeah. Joe Lowe, okay. Well, J-H-O-L-O-W. Yeah, not J-Lo. So Joe Lowe in 2000, um, got to know a lot of celebrities because he was able to siphon through his other cast of corrupt characters, siphon money through this government fund to hire um, actors and actresses like Paris Hilton, um, uh, like uh, Lindsay Lohan, bring them to parties to, to, to uh, have them travel to Las Vegas to, to sort of like schmooze with the celebrities. No one seemed to know how he got there. No one seemed to know how he got his money. But one thing that irked me to no, no end was when Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese were looking for financing for Wolf of Wall Street. They were going to get some financing, but were put under restrictions. All of a sudden, Joe Lowe, because he got to know these celebrities, said, I can finance it basically 100%. Nefarious ways that he got this money. Exactly. Like most people um, that later, have a lot of money. They, someone blew the whistle. Everyone was exposed. This actually ended up in the Department of Justice going after Joe Lowe. Joe Lowe went to China to, to escape being uh, brought back to the, the States. Um, the feds actually, the FBI, had Leonardo DiCaprio interviewed, interviewed as a witness, and all of a sudden, you know, Leonardo is just lent everything out. The really? Fact that Joe Lowe gave him presents. Now, do you know Leonardo DiCaprio had an Oscar before he got an Oscar? I can't. I, I, bleh. So, yes. So, he <laughs> got, so, Joe Lowe, to pay favor to Leonardo for his birthday. You mean he gave him an Oscar just yes, like gave him Yes, bought one? Marlon Brando's Oscar. Jesus. From what? On the waterfront or streetcar or which one? I, I don't know which one. But he bought that and gave it to Joe, uh, gave it to Leonardo DiCaprio before he got this. Who the hell would want it if you didn't get it by merit? Especially Leo. I can't even imagine. It's funny when they put Leonardo on trial as a witness against Joe Lowe. Right. Because at that point, Leonardo was like, I ain't going to jail for this guy. I'm giving everything up. Yeah, no. He's well, not a dummy when it comes to Hollywood. Yeah, plus he's an actor. He, well, he doesn't want to wreck his career. He's oh, got a great career. Of course. And he worked out a deal with the feds that he gave back the Oscar, gave back the artwork, gave back um, $60 million uh, between him, That's the production company. Leo. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. About 60, 60 million back. Um, but at the end of the day, you still, you still stole. It's like politics corrupting Hollywood. And I think we don't All talk right. enough about how the corruption of Hollywood it's affects terrible. our films. Well, I know I'm on a soapbox. I know we need to get back to the Revenant. Yeah. But that just gives me such a nasty rub. When I watch Leonardo, I can't. I'm like, dude, like, y y how did you not know this? Well, I, I love him, okay? Okay, let's and get back to And especially from film. Gilbert Grape, when he first started, that kid or person, is, he's, a, he's an incredible actor. I mean, he really, really is. The director, Alejandro Inaritu, or Inaratu, nobody liked him. Very difficult. He fired everybody. And he won two Best Director Oscars consecutively. Birdman, which I hated I've that I've never movie. seen that movie. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't like it. I think it was awful. I just, I sat there, I watched it twice, because sometimes I think I'm like, I'm demented why I don't like it. But people say they love something because they feel they should love something, and they're so afraid to not go with the lemmings over the cliff, you know? Cinematographer, Emmanuel Lubezki, he won three Oscars in a row. And this guy's a good cinematographer. I mean, he was natural lighting and everything. Gravity, I mm -hmm. think that was that, um, What's his face? George Clooney thing, Birdman, and The Revenant. Well, all three of them, you could put them in a bag and throw them out the window as far as I'm concerned. I could care less. I had to see all of them. The Revenant, I think, is the best out of the three. I'm not saying it's a bad film, but it's like, 
uh, you know. So tell me something, because doing my research, I actually yeah. got interested in Alejandro's films that he directed. Yes. And he has a very interesting history or uh, how he got into film. Like he okay. Was, he, he was uh, literally like kicked out of school. He wasn't, he wasn't smart. He was from a large family, but he got into the media business being on the radio uh, in Mexico. Okay. Later, he, he actually made short films. So for you short filmmakers out there that want to go further and up and beyond, um, here's a, uh, a young man at the time who started his film career with shorts. Mm -hmm. And he also did promotional videos for the advertisers of the radio show that he was um, the host. Okay. He got his, um, I guess, his attention when he did the movie Babel. Now, have you seen I don't that? know that, no. I'm like a 2006 Babel. Um, he uses... We can't see everything, you know. We only know. have well, so many hours in the day. Well, maybe maybe it's something that we should look at, like films Please outside don't. the U.S. I don't, I don't think so. All right, well, we'll see. I thought by researching a little bit more by the, about the director that it made me interested in his films, but you're not giving me a different opinion of him. So I'm curious. No. Um, I, I want to inter put, put this into here, too, for Leo. Um, he said it was the hardest performance he ever did, which is crazy. But well, he, he had to learn to do the whole film. Like, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah, but uh, he had to learn uh, two Indian languages. He devoured raw meat. He's a vegetarian. So I guess for a vegetarian to devour meat, that's like the ultimate everything. Right. He ate bison liver? Yes, he in did. That one scene yes, where he's, he's like, very realistic. I'm thinking it's a hard He had to movie. learn how to shoot a gun. Like, come on. But then he had to learn from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood to have a flamethrower, which was great. And after that, he was so worn out, he took two years off, and then he came back and did oh, Once Upon a Time in Leonardo. Hollywood. A good picture, a great picture, not like The Revenant. They consider it, now this drives me nuts, the second highest grossing Western after Dances with Wolves, and when I read that, I wanted to throw up. Because it is not a Western. <laughs> I don't care. I am not a Western. Reverend is not a Western. Can I ask you um, a, jo a, a Joe thing? Go for it. All right. Trivia. What? Joe things are trivia questions. Yes. Now we try to stump each other, and he tries to make me look like a nut. And I'm just well, that trying. That does it by itself. No, I know. Makes it look like a nut. Well, I'm, I'm going to take it off and whip my hair back soon. So, Joe, do you know what the arc of this picture is? Not the bear. That's an inception arc. That's different. So I, I thought like the wife like coming back into his like the flashback when he was trying to when he was dying. Nope. When Tom Hardy gets to the fort and he's sitting with the captain, can you guess what it is? The young boy that was there, he's guilt-ridden. Guilt right. And then the flask appears. The flask is the ark. It has that little handmade inscription. Because the it. ark is, comes up, and then something changes, and then there's the denouement of the picture. Uh, excuse me? Well, it goes into the denouement. That's what it's called, the end of a movie. And it changes everything, so it creates can you action. Can change from, like, going into our I scene? know, it's a dead. Denouement. 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 D E N O U N U M E N T. One thing I got to say, it drives me crazy. And I look at this and I wait for it. Dialogue. But they said, F and they called a woman's boobers. Hello. They did not use that. It did not come into the language until later off. They called women's bosoms. And even there was I didn't a slag term, there was a slang term, but it was not. Hello. It didn't come until later. I hope it's it shocking our audience. Then, huh? It didn't exist then. Right, and at, they did say f once, but f didn't come in until later on in the culture. The use of swear words. It wasn't considered a swear word, even though it did come out from fornication under control of the king at the time in England with uh, what's his face, Henry VIII. See, and that, that you know things like that's the kind of stuff drives me nuts. Well, because it's not being true to the story into the time period. Well, who listens to that but me? But I always looked at like there was a picture called Revolution that Al Pacino was in it, and he was running around in the beginning, the first five minutes. I was watching with a friend. He goes, "The British suck." Now, who's at, what soldier says the British suck in the Revolutionary War? There's no such thing. No, and no the sucking? picture was in a revolutionary war. Well, they might have done it behind closed door, but they didn't. Suck wasn't a term like they blow. New, old, western, non-western. I have all men, no. I have all I, no because what? this is a survival adventure to me. I do not call it a western. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. 
So I'm going to give you some other survival things, okay? And here you can watch them. And I'm going to tell you if they're good or they're bad, but they are in that genre. And that's a particular genre, okay? One is The Gray, 2011, starring Liam Neeson and Dermot Mulroney. Everybody loves Liam Neeson. It was not that popular, not that many people saw it. It's very linear. You know, the guys are out there. They're going, Liam Neeson saving them. The wolves are running around. Man in the Wilderness, which is in 1971. I'm glad you mentioned that because this was a reference point to this movie The Revenant. Exactly, it's about as, Hugh Glass. Right, as a uh, reincarnation, Correct. Or, or, a, a reboot of that movie. <laughs> and it's Richard Harris, who we know and love from older movies, and John Huston. Apocalypto. When the Mayan kingdom is in decline, a young man is taken on a perilous journey into a world ruled by fear and oppression. It's directed by Mel Gibson before his fall from grace. Jeremiah Johnson, here we go, normal. Robert Redford, we've come full circle back to Robert Redford, 1972. Jeremiah what? Johnson. Jeremiah Johnson, was he a bullfrog, Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a Johnson. And they're all about survival under adverse conditions, one man against insurmountable forces, and it's the common theme in this genre, The Revenant is a Wilderness Adventure. Hmm. Drop the mic. The Revenant, all in a nutshell, he got a guy in the wilderness, survives death a hundred million times, runs his way through an Academy Award, and gets a bunch of notoriety, and... It was dominated for 12 Oxes, it won three for director, actor, and cinematography, but I can say, uh, it is uh, a physically and emotionally uh, painful uh, picture. A painful? It made me feel uh, exhausted. Uh, I've seen the thing three times now, because I have to review, you know, besides this, I do film reviews, so I have to look forward to worth. see it. Yeah, it's a bleak, emotional, stressful picture, Ugh. and after watching it, I felt like a washcloth hung out to dry. Oh, Debbie! Uh. While I have my Climax Ooh. beer... Should I drink that? You should. If you oh, want a Climax, drink this beer. I'd like a Climax. The first microbrew licensed in the state of New Jersey, 1995. That's a side <laughs> note. Drink, get a Climax. Um... The question I posed earlier was, 25 years from now, when this passes the 25-year mark, actually even less than that, will people look back and consider this a classic? Let's put the prediction forward. What do you think? No. The Revenant, it didn't do it for me, didn't do it for you. Yeah, I, I so, don't want to watch it again. So, Deb, where are we going from here? Well, as I always say, you never know where we're going until we go there.